John chapter number 15, verse number 9. The Bible says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that you that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever, I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Brother Josh, can you turn me down a little bit? sounds a little hot <clears throat> but in this chapter Christ speaking I mean we could start off in you know verse number one I am the true vine hallelujah we don't have a fake one right he's the one that was planted before we can even comprehend he's always been never will die out but true vine true vine means it doesn't bring forth corrupt fruit if you're in him you know you're good Right? Why do you think that the Lord said, taste and see that the Lord is good? Because he's got the true vine. Right? But by the time we get down to verse number 9, we first hear about the Father's love. As the Father hath loved me. That's one thing that I don't think I'll ever be able to wrap my head around until we get a body and mind like his and we get to glory. To truly comprehend the love that the Father has for the Son. But then he goes on to say, As my Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Well, let's retract that statement. Well, if Christ loved us with the same love that the Father loved the Son, then we do know how much the Father loved the Son. Because the Father loved the Son, and the Son loved us the same way. That's what he just said. Then he says, Continue ye in my love. Now what does... That little phrase there. You could break that down a few different ways. Continue in my love meaning live every single one of your days with the love that I've given you. Meaning take this and go with it. That's what he's talking about. That's, that's an allowance. Continue on this allowance until I show up again and give you some more. That's not what he's talking about. Because, I mean psalmist says that daily he renews his promises towards me. That means every day he recommits to the love that he has showed me. So he's not saying here's the love take it with you. No, every day I receive love. So, if he's not talking about continuing with what we had, is he referring to every day receive that love? Wake up every morning and make sure you receive the love of God. I'm glad that I don't have to acknowledge God's love in order to receive it. He loved me with an everlasting love. He loved me before I ever was. I have nothing to do with the fact that God chose to love me. I didn't merit, didn't do, didn't convince, didn't haggle. No, God chose to love me. It's not contingent on me and what I did to deserve it because I didn't do anything, couldn't deserve it couldn't merit it so he's not saying continue in other words every day make sure you stop by the gas station and fill up on God's love no that's not what he's talking about when he says continue ye in my love he's already said as the father loved me I loved you so continue in the love that I showed you show the love that Christ showed us to others when he says, continue ye in my love, remember how I loved you and you love that way. The Father loved the Son and then the Son loved us the same way we should love others the same way that Christ loved us. To continue in the love of God means to let it abound in our life. That it becomes so much a part of us that it shows out. Why do you think that the first fruit mentioned by the Apostle Paul fruit of the spirit a sign that the Holy Ghost indwells you 
lives inside of you. Love. Second one's joy. Well, he goes on to say in verse number thir- or verse number eleven, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. But what are those things? Uh, before we get to that, verse number ten, and then verse number eleven. He's saying, what I just talked about in verse number 10, which we're getting ready to go to in a second. He said, I've instructed you these things so that my joy will remain in you. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, but it is a blessing from God. You can have nothing in this world that will bring you joy. Nothing from a sin-cursed and a tainted, self-serving, prideful, and rebellious world will give you joy. But we do know that it can take it away from you. We do know that people can rob you of your joy. You can rob yourself of your joy. The devil can rob you of your joy. There are many things that can take it, but there's only one place that you can get it. That's him. So when he says that my joy will remain in you, but then he doesn't say, I just don't want you to have a little bit of joy. I want your joy to be full. Right? Pressed down, shaking, bubbling over. I want you to be so joyful that you almost can't stand it. Right? Like, I believe Brother Phil might be a little joyful. At some other people, I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen them joyful. I don't even think I've seen them happy. Right? But Brother Phil, happy, 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 all the time. You start talking about Jesus, he perks up. Right? I believe that some people know what it's like to have their joy full. And then sometimes I wonder if people know what joy is at all. Christ says, I don't want you to just have my joy in you. But more importantly, oh, that's why I said that. I'll avoid that. I don't want you to just have my joy in your life. I want it to be full. I want that no matter what comes in your life, whether storms, whether sunshine, whether high waves, or whether it's calm sailing, Right, whether you're your heart broken or whether you're around those that just you know, fill your heart with enthusiasm and excitement, whether you suffer loss or whether you suffer gain, I want my joy to be so full in your life that you are steadied. A man can do anything if he has hope. You know what joy is? Honestly, joy is a fruit of faith. We had faith in the Lord Jesus. And as a result, he gave us love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. But joy being a fruit of faith. Right? If a man has hope, he can do anything. Why? Because his hope brings him joy. Every, you know, this week I've been listening on YouTube, the stories of men in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, You know, even in the Iraq wars, men that did miraculous things, you would say, there's no way that a man could do that. Or they stood in the face of what was overwhelming odds, and they prevailed. Some of them lost their life, but in the process saved all of their comrades' lives. What would compel a man to do such a thing? Hope. They may have no hope for themselves, But they said, if I do this, my friends can get out. If I hold this hill, the army can come and reinforce us and then get through this place that we've had such trouble taking. Their hope brings them joy. Did not Christ embrace the cross for the joy that was set before Him? He endured such suffering. Endured such mockery, such shame. The shame of every sin ever committed placed upon Him that was seated in heavenly places. Had angels sing to Him how holy, holy, holy He was. The earth was His footstool, but now He's suspended between heaven and earth, embracing that shame and mockery. Why? For the joy that was before. That many sons could come to the Father. That through the true vine, many branches could be grafted in. They could be taken from a dead plant, the world, 
grafted into the true vine and bear much fruit to the Father. That's what verse number 8 says. Herein is the Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. He became cut off, cast out. He took our death in hell so that we could have hope in Him. That we could receive the love of God. But the key to our joy, first His joy being in us, and then that that joy may be full. Verse number 10. If ye shall keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Doesn't say that ye shall have my love. No, no, no. It says abide. One of my favorite verses. Psalm 91, verse number 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Got two words in that verse. Dwell and abide. You can dwell at a hotel. I just realized that rhymed. You can dwell in a hotel, but you don't abide there. You can dwell in a cave like David did. Right? Dwelling shows temporary place. Right? If we temporarily commit ourselves, He doesn't command that 24 hours a day we spend in a secret place with Him. Right? He's taken up a secret place in us so that we have Him always through the Holy Ghost. We have been made His tabernacle. But He doesn't say that in order to have the blessings of God in your life, every day you have to go out and sacrifice. Every day you've got to be in prayer. You've got to do X, Y, Z. All the law is fulfilled in this. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and then love thy neighbor as thyself. That's what Jesus said. He didn't say that if we keep His commandments, we'll dwell in His love. No, 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 no. Abide. That's permanence. That means that you always got a place there. That's all what you may leave and go out into the world for a bit, but home is with Him. Means that you may be out in the Father's fields, but you're still on the Father's property. You're at the Father's house. The Father may send you on His business, but if He sends you, He's sending you with love to get you there and back. You live in the Father's love. Live in the love of the Son. Abide. Means that that's what your hope is in. If you abode, or you make your abode, with let's say, my brother Uncle Rod. Because he married my Aunt Lynn. Technically he's my uncle, but he's also my brother. Brother Uncle Rod. If I decide that it's God's will, and it's not, you don't have to worry about me moving in with you. But if my abode is with Rod. My faith is not in the walls of the house. My hope is not in the concrete that may be the foundation of that house. My hope is in the one who owns the house. My faith is that if he said, hey, you may be going through something, we got an extra bed, you come live with us for a while. My hope is not in the bed. It's not in the foundation. Although he is the foundation. He's the chief cornerstone. Right? He's the rock of ages. He's not just the foundation. He's the whole thing. But my hope is not in the walls or in the windows or in the wallpaper or paint. It's not in the furnace that may keep it warm. No, no, no. My hope is in the one who owns it. Because if I trust the one that owns it, I trust he's taking care of all that stuff. If my hope is in the one that said, I've got a place for you, you can live here. If I believe him, I believe that everything else is taken care of. I believe that as a gracious and kind host, that that person would have everything taken care of ahead of time. May not be the four seasons, right? May not be Trump Tower, but I believe that it's the best that they would give. So how much more if God says, you can abide in my love? My hope is not in the blessings or the richness. No, no, my hope is in His love. And what is love? Well, God is love. 
So when he says that you can abide in my love, what he's saying is you can live in me. Dwell in me. But what's the contingency? If you keep my commandments. We don't have time to get into all of them today. But, you know, rebellion is just the sin of witchcraft. To not do as he is instructed is the same thing as calling on false gods and pagans and everything else. Why? Because I've made myself my own God. And I've decided I don't need to do what God told me to do. That's witchcraft. It's idolatry. Only I'm the idol. We don't have time to get into all that though. But if you should keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandment, and abide in Him. We know that He and the Father are one. So He says, if you abide in my love, you abide in me. That's why we're one. Why do you think that the Holy Spirit indwells us? To seal us, because I can't seal myself. I am in Him, and He is in me. So, not just I can receive love, but His love can abide in me, and I can abide in it. That it can be all-consuming in my life. Why? Why is that so important? Because verse number 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Well, how can I love someone else as Christ has loved me if I don't have the love of the Father? Because the Father loved the Son, and the Son loved us with the same love. He didn't say love others as you can love them. No, as He loved us. Which really means love others as the Father has loved the Son. That's what He's saying. He's not saying love them as you know, somebody else may love them. No, no, no. We have a very high standard. When He says love one another as I have loved you, what He's saying is love those like God loved the Son. Like the Father loved His only begotten. That's a pretty high standard. We know that Christians are supposed to have love one for another, but he didn't qualify in verse number 12. This is my command, that you love one another as I have loved you. Doesn't say love people in the church. Doesn't say love people in your family. One another. Who was Jesus talking to in this passage? A group of those that believed on him and those that didn't believe on him. Both crowds were there, lost and saved. So if both were there, he said, y'all love one another. He was telling lost people that they needed to love like, first that they needed to receive his love so that they could love like him. But then he's telling saved people, you don't just love those that are disciples of me. Love all of them. Because Christ loved all of them. For God so loved the world. that He gave His only begotten Son. So if God gave His very best for a lost and dying world, He's telling His followers to love them with the very best. Even though they may despitefully use you, even though they may be your enemy, even though they may wish very evil for you, we're commanded not only to love them, to pray for them, to do good unto them. That if a man compels us to go with him a mile, we go with him twain. And not to do it out of bitterness, do it out of love. So then we get to verse number 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We know that Christ laid down his life. I mean, verse number 15, or 14. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. But then, verse number 15. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. In other words, he's saying, I've kept no secrets from you. A lot of them didn't get some of those secrets until after he had already done what he had been sent to accomplish. How many times did the writers of the gospel say they heard this, but they didn't get it until after he had gone to the cross or already ascended into heaven? or that it was brought to their remembrance when he went before Pontius Pilate that he said he would die the death of the cross. Right? He told them everything. Some of them didn't get it. But he shared all of it. Kept no secrets. 
So we know that love is open. He said, I've loved you, not as servants, but as friends. In order for someone to be your friend, that means that they know all your strengths, all your weaknesses, all your good, all your bad, all the highlights in your life, all the flaws and all the valleys, and they still choose to be your friend. Christ knew who we were, yet died for us. That's a friend. But he said, ye are my friends if you do my commandments. But he says, you're not servant, you're friends. Because he knew everything about us and yet entered into this world. But then he said, here's everything about me. Right? There are no secrets. He laid bare who he was from day one. There wasn't anything that we need to know that he didn't tell us. We know that there's no fault in him. But he left every detail that we needed to go back and from page one of this Bible until the end have without a doubt certainty that he was the son of God and one of those details was that he loved us as friends so then I'm thinking this week also been listening to some other stuff I've been sitting there okay we know that we ought to love others with the love of the Father. We know that God is love. We know that we've received the love of God. But anybody ever had somebody ask you, hey, what is, what, what is the love of God like? Define the love of God. Well, I can give you scripture. The love of God sent His only begotten Son. No, but re you ever had a kid that was like me and asked why a whole bunch of st stuff? Or, hey, what's this? Right? You ever had a kid ask you, hey, what is love? And not talking about that 80s song. But define love. Right? Anybody got a concise answer off the top of your head? No, it's a complex thing. Right? It's la I mean, it's layered and wrapped in complexities. How do you succinctly say, this is how, as Christians, we ought to love? Define it. What well, we're supposed to love is God loved us. We don't even know how much God loved us. We cannot comprehend the magnitude that God has showed love toward us. I know what I have felt and received. I get in here and I find out the great lengths that God went through. But God loves us more than even we can comprehend. Half of it's not even been told. So even if you got half of it, God still loves you twice as much. And then, then some. An everlasting love. Right? Before we were even in existence, before He formed us in the belly, He knew us, knew everything that we would be, and still chose to love us before we even did all the sinful acts that we did. How do you convey to somebody else that that's how we're supposed to love other people? It's hard. But I've been listening, been doing some reading. I'm studying best definition of what true love is that God has showed toward man is that you willfully or you choose to take on suffering so that somebody else doesn't have to go through it you choose don't have to it wouldn't come to you otherwise wouldn't be in your life if it weren't for this person but yet you choose to say, I'll take that so that they don't have to. That is true love. You embrace suffering so that somebody else doesn't have to go through it. You embrace pain. You embrace loss. You go through the hardness to save somebody else from it. How many parents go hungry so that their kids don't have to? How many parents go through or go and put on clothes that may have holes or seams that have been patched up who knows how many times so that their kids can have new clothes to go to school but that's love in fact in the New Testament we get over to the Apostle Paul uses the word charity all the time well you know what charity means? love 
Charity means you didn't have to, but you chose to. Charity means that you could have used it, on, but you gave so that someone else could have gain. That's love. In the Greek, they tell me it's that agape love. You know what that was? A sacrificial love. Love so much that you sacrifice so that someone else can have. What kind of love did God show towards us? It was a sacrificial love. He lost and we gained. Right? I mean, just imagine some of the things. As I, you know, I started thinking about that. But before we get to that, if love is embracing or sacrificing and embracing suffering or pain or hardship so that somebody else doesn't have to, truth then is the messenger of love. Did he not say in verse number 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth or doth. But I have called you friends, for all things I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. We wouldn't know how much God loved us if God didn't tell us. You know what lies do? They cover up love. If somebody were to ask you, well, hey, you know how this happened? No. Although you may have watched somebody come in and put a card on somebody's desk. Right? You may have been the in-between person. Say, hey, somebody wanted you to have this. Right? If we cover up, if we don't express the truth behind it, they won't understand the love that caused that act to come about. Jesus didn't just come out of the blue one day no it was planned before the foundation of the earth it was planned long ago but yet it was planned not just that he would do it but that there would be a record and that man would have the truth behind what God did because without truth you don't really understand the love of God without truth you can't express love to somebody else right why do you think freedom of speech is so important in our nation because the truth has a lot of great qualities one of them is that without truth you can't really love somebody and without this truth we can't love the way that God wants us to love if this is watered down if this is changed if this is broken apart we do not know how much God really loved us because you know what the love of God does it convicts knowing how much he loved us causes us to realize how much we don't love like he does getting into find these promises that God long before we ever existed knew that we would need knew that these would be a strength and a comfort unto us you know what the promises of God are he's saying I promise this is going to be true so that when we realize it's true we understand how much he loves us the promise is that he would do it the only thing that keeps it from happening is that we haven't gotten to that point yet. But once we get there, we realize He did love us that much. The more people go through, the more they understand how much God loves them. But here's the thing. A lot of people don't want to go through because they love what they have or they love who they think they are more than they love God. You say, how do you say that? Because Jesus embraced death and hell received it for me so that I wouldn't have to go through it you want to talk about embracing suffering right we here nowadays we say I think our pastor quoted it on it was either Wednesday or Sunday morning but he said oh death where is thy sting grave where is thy victory you know why we can say that because Jesus felt the sting of death Jesus took our hell rose victorious over the grave so that we weren't kept in bondage by it for all eternity I don't know what the sting of death feels like Jesus does and he took it for me to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord I go to sleep and I wake up in glory he felt the pain and the cost of sin the wages of sin is death 
I'll never feel death. He did. The thing that people are afraid of, right? The thing that wake, you know, keeps people awake at night, that one day they've got an appointment and they're not going to miss it. And they're trying to figure out how to get the most out of what they have now because they know to fear death. I'll never feel it. But He took it for me. I'll never know the abandonment that comes with being laid in a grave. He was cut off from the Father. Broke fellowship with the one that was from the beginning in tandem with the Son. And yet when He gave up the ghost, when He laid His life down, He entered in to a place that the Father could not go. Because the Father was alive. Always has been, always will be. He knows what it is to be isolated above anything else that we can. Some people freak out if you put them in a small room and the lights are off. Right? Can you imagine what death's like? I don't know. Can you imagine what the grave is like? I'll never have to. But he took it and embraced it because he loved me and didn't want me to go through it. Now you want to talk about sacrificial love? The Father. Can you imagine the pain? That song that Sister Crystal sings, how great the Father's love for us. I believe it's the second verse. says, The pain and searing loss that the Father had when He broke fellowship with His Son. When He had to impute upon Him the iniquity of us all and turn His back on His Son. Broke His heart so much He shut the Son off so that the world could not see what His Son was. He cursed His only begotten Son for us. Now let's put that in retrospect. Brother Ray, that'd be like you taking all you know, the debt, all the bills, everything that you got that you have ever had. Everything that everybody else in your family has. And I know that He's not your only begotten. But it'd be like taking that and saying, okay, Raymond, here it is. It'd be like taking his bank account and draining it into the meth heads and the coke addicts and the pot heads and everybody else that we would look at as the off-scour of the world. It'd be like taking everything he has, giving it to them. And I know he, he got married not too long ago. But it'd be like putting him and his wife out on the street so that you could give his room and his house in California where it's always nice weather and it's too hot for me still but taking everything that he has and giving it to the person that you know is going to misabuse it. It'd be like taking a child in your house and saying, I can't be associated with you anymore. You're kicked out so that I can give it not to somebody that deserves it, but somebody that you know they're going to strip the paint off the walls. They're going to tear the room. It's going to look like an utter ruin by the time that person gets a hold of it. But because you love that person so much, you embrace it and say, I'll break fellowship with my only begotten son, the only thing the father had, and I'm going to give it to a beggar, the wretched, the adulterers, the adulteresses, at the point of the idolaters, the pagans, the hypocrites, the, you know, the worst of the worst. And he did it. Can you imagine the pain of telling your, your only begotten child, I can't have fellowship with you anymore. We know that fellowship was restored. But the one that always had been in fellowship was not in fellowship. We talk about all that Christ went through. How much did it break the Father's heart to do that? But the Bible tells us yet it pleased him to bruise him. Because he knew that his creation, man, would be reconciled. That kind of pain, that's love. He loved us so much that although he hated to do it, he saw the finished product and it pleased the Father to break fellowship with his son. In other words, God saw that pain, saw what we would be in Christ, and he said, I'll embrace the pain because it's better for them. That's love. I was thinking, what about the Holy Spirit? 
People don't talk about him a lot. That's his office work. He doesn't bring attention to himself. He brings attention to the Son. But we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. I know that for Christ to walk in a sin-cursed world every day, I know that Spurgeon said it'd be like him walking through a briar patch, or us walking through a briar patch naked. That it, it pricked at him all the time. Not to mention what the pain was for the one that was holy to have the sin of all mankind through all creation imputed onto him. Now, I know that. But what about the Holy Spirit? We know that He seals our soul from the moment that we got saved. I don't know how God did that operation so quick, but He did it. And we're sealed. It means that the sin can't get in. That our soul will never sit. That's why our soul is saved. The body isn't saved. Flesh isn't saved. But what's the buffer between the flesh and the soul? The Spirit. What pain does the Holy Spirit endure when we knowingly sin against God? Does that pain Him? I know that it, the Bible talks about that if I have unrepentant sin in my life, it grieves my own spirit, my own soul. Because my soul longs after the things of God. How much more does it grieve the Holy Spirit, who is God? How much does it pain the Holy Spirit to know that even though He has tried to convict us, even though He has discerned the Word of God for us and showed us what it means when we choose to still not do, when every day He knows how many times He's given us those red flags or those moments that say, hey, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Or when He says, hey, instead of giving an answer, pray about it, but we ignore Him. What pain does that bring to God? But yet he does it. One, because he knows that we couldn't keep our own salvation. And he says, I'll embrace this pain and suffering and loss so that they can gain everlasting life. But how much more that he chooses to endure it time and time and time and time again through his long suffering towards us. Right? Those idle thoughts that we didn't even know were coming. And we may repent of it in the moment, but yet... The Holy Ghost has to keep us sealed against that sin. It's our problem for Him. He's God. But how much pain does that bring to God? That we sinned after He saved us. I mean, you think about how much God sacrificed and how much God gave. But then you start getting an understanding. You don't figure it out. I mean, we're not even scratching the surface. But you start meditating on as the Father had loved Jesus. That's how Jesus loved us. And we're supposed to love others with the way that He loved us. When was the last time that not for gain, because the Bible says that's what the heathen does. The heathens love one another because by loving they give, but then they also get back. That's not love. Right? That's just human nature. I'll do good to you if you do good to me. Love is it's more blessed to give than to receive. Love is God loveth a cheerful giver. Not just talking about tithing there, by the way. Those that give love on the Father's account, they say, Lord, today I want to be a conduit of your love to somebody else. I cannot love them with my own love, Lord. I need you to show forth your love in me. Well, you know what that means? You look at suffering. You look at pain. Somebody's cussing you out in the job and you want to tell them what they can do and where they can go do it. But instead, you embrace that pain to say, hey, I just want to let you know, Jesus loves you. Trust me. I got, I got that, whatever that thing is that dad has, where if somebody I'm, doesn't take a whole lot to get me angry, but I'm better than I used to. And nowadays, like that wick, it's still short wick, but right? still got a short fuse. It's just like watered down a whole lot. God's been, you know, just pumping that, keeping it wet. But every now and then, somebody says something and they do something, and that sucker lights. I don't think of it through the context of, I love that. I think of, I can't ruin a testimony because I want to knock this guy out. 
A lot of times, really, it's not even the one to knock them out. I just want to shoot them in the foot. I want to kill them, but I want to shoot them in the foot. But can't do that. But what's my my context is not why well, I can't do that. Because I want to show them the love of God. Most of the time, I'm thinking about me. When was the last time that somebody was actively trying to do evil against you? But yet you chose not to. Well, I want to preserve my testimony. No, I want to love that person. I want to embrace the suffering that it's going to be to be around them. I'll embrace the hate that they may show to me. And I want to love them as God loved me. Because that's what Christ did. He wasn't thinking about himself. He wasn't thinking about what was best for him. He said, I love them, so I'll become what they are so that they don't have to pay the price for it. And while he became it, he still retained all of his... He was still the perfect lamb, without spot and without blemish. You can love the world without becoming the world. We are more than conquerors through our Lord. We can conquer... But how often do we do, not because we love, but because we don't want to, Lord, I don't want to disappoint you. Well, he said, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in his love. He says that we're his friends. If we do whatsoever he commanded us, he commanded us to love others as he loved us. By not choosing to embrace, it may be hard. You may suffer. You may lose out on some things but you knowingly ahead of time say I know that's going to be the case but I choose to love them so that they can experience the love of God I'd say one of the reasons that the modern day church is so apathetic is so lackadaisical is because people have forgotten what it is to love other people we love ourselves, we love our family, we love church. But Christ loved those that the world said were unlovable. And He didn't just accidentally love them, He chose to love them. Chose to embrace the suffering, the hardness, the heartbreak, the sleepless nights, the hours on your knees in prayer. Chose to accept it all so that they could experience the love that the Father showed Him. Are we so selfish? Are we so prideful that we say, I don't want to endure the suffering, so I won't love other people? Are we that hard-hearted? Or are there still some that say, I want to love as Christ loved me. So I embrace hardness and stuff, not for my credit, not for my glory, but so that the Father is glorified, so that His Son is lifted up, and that He draws all men unto Him. Because I can promise you this, if you love as God loved you, you knew when God loved you. When it finally dawned on you how much God loved you, you got it. You realize this isn't love as the world does. But how will others know it unless somebody else shows and shines that love to them? They'll know that it's not the love of man, that it's not you doing it once they finally get it. They'll know where to give the credit and the glory. But in order to get there, it might be painful. There might be suffering. There might be sacrifice. There might be loss. There may even be heartbreak. But are you willing to embrace it? Knowing ahead of time, this might hurt, but I'm going to do it because it's what's best for them. Not for me. Not for anybody else. I choose to take that suffering so that they don't suffer for all of eternity. I will embrace the pain so they don't know what the fire of hell feels like. I'll embrace the pain so that they get back to the Father's house where they know they ought to be because I know the pain that the soul goes through when it doesn't have fellowship with the Father. Choosing to embrace all that man doesn't like, all that our flesh hates for the betterment of somebody else. Do we love that way? Are we willing to love that way? I don't know. But I know that that's what the Lord told us to do. 
Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.